Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Think Tech, where we're raising public awareness about a range of issues, global events. Think Tech also brings us things about energy, uh, diversification, a range. And as part of the Think Tech series, our show today, Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome two distinguished guests who are going to help inform us about a critical issue at the moment, the crisis in Ukraine. I'm joined today by Dr. Patrick Bratton, a political science professor, and Dr. Brian Price. And I'll introduce both of them in just a moment. First, I want to remind our listeners that we do broadcast live every day between 1 and 5. We've got different shows going all the time. All of these shows are streamed live on the Internet. You can find them at Spreaker.com or Ustream.tv. Uh, best way, is, if you are confused already, is just to go to our link, thinktechhawaii.com, where you'll have links to all of those. And of course, they're saved as a podcast. You can come back to it later. Uh, if you want to join us here in our downtown gallery uh, for any of the shows, just write to j at thinktechhawaii.com. That's J-A-Y, thinktechhawaii.com. And coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza here in the heart of Honolulu, uh, again, I'm delighted to be joined and, and want to welcome our two guests today, Dr. Patrick Bratton uh, and Dr. Brian Price. And perhaps uh, before we get into this important conversation, there's, a, there's obviously an unfold crisis and, and we're going to try to bring some context, some analysis, how do we make sense of it, where do we look to for understanding it. Uh, but maybe at the outset, if I could have each of you briefly introduce yourselves, tell us your areas of interest and expertise, and so perhaps starting with Patrick Bratton. Oh, thank you, Carlos, for that introduction. I'm Dr. Patrick Bratton. I'm an associate professor of political science at Hawaii Pacific University. I mostly work on national security and foreign policy uh, issues, uh, in, mostly in sort of Asia with a little bit in, in Europe as well. Yeah, I'm Dr. Brian Price, this is Professor of History at uh, Hawaii Pacific, and recently come back from Afghanistan where I was doing sociocultural research, specialized right now, interest in mostly in insurgency and counterinsurgency. Excellent. And, you know, one of the challenges of trying to make sense, we see headlines, we have, you know, ongoing things that are, you know, telling us there's a serious crisis, military issues, and what I want us to do here and uh, to help, you know, uh, get a better perspective on this is maybe look at various pieces of it, various levels, if you will, and, uh, you know, one way we see this as a crisis, a showdown between Russia and its leader and basically the U.S., the European Union, the U.S., uh, in many ways this reflects a lot of sort of great power politics, and some are referring to it as Cold War or redux. So perhaps, Bratton, if you can give us a quick snapshot, how is this context, uh, how do we get informed, how do we make sense of this from the perspective of a, you know, bigger global crisis? It's difficult. I mean, we've had more than 20 years since the end of the Cold War, and so you had the sort of brief honeymoon period through the late 1980s, early 1990s, where Russia was sort of, the Cold War was over, you know, the, the wall came down, Eastern Europe, various parts of the Soviet Union broke away, and there was kind of this euphoria in the early 1990s, really since the sort of mid to late 1990s, what we've seen is a sort of solidification or a more sort of nationalist to Eurasian approach in Russian foreign policy. And while we sort of label that on Putin, and Putin plays a large role, I mean, that's a larger sort of structural thing that we've seen in Russia before Putin came to power in the 1990s, uh, way before he came to power. So you have this kind of uh, contest, if you will, or sort of in, you know, spheres of influence over, the, over Eastern Europe. And part of the problem has been is that, you know, from a Russian perspective, um, there are still these institutions and organs of the Cold War still alive and still sort of looking like it's containing or trying to destabilize Russia's space or sphere of influence. You know, so from the Russian perspective, why does NATO still exist? And moreover, why does NATO keep getting expanded? And, and many times seeing that the West has made promises not to expand uh, uh, NATO any further, and then particularly in sort of NATO expansion euphoria back in 07 to 08, there are these ideas that Georgia and Ukraine were going to go in. And I, again, that's sort of unsettling for the Russians. Uh, but particularly if you look at the Ukraine, the Ukraine has a very sp sort of special history with Russia. Mm -hmm. You can think about the origins of Russian civilization, go back to Kievian Rus that's in Ukraine, and moreover there's been parts of sort of Ukraine and Russia that have sort of switched back and forth depending on the regime. So Crimea, which is of course in the news today, I mean, used to be part of Russia, and then Khrushchev gave it to the Ukraine back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ukraine itself, I mean, the name, Ukraine, means a sort of borderland, a meeting area between, you know, east and west, as we always say, with Russia. But there's sort of respect from Russia that a lot of these former Soviet territories are what's often called the near abroad, or often the Russians refer to this as Nasha, which means ours in Russian, if you will. And so there's a feeling that they should have more influence. And it's been difficult for the Ukrainian leadership in the past, say, 20 years to try and tilt that balance between East and West. 
and with varying degrees of success, or we could say lack of success in the last couple of years, about how to have some sort of relationship with the West, economic that mm -hmm. Ukraine needs, but it's still very economically dependent on Russia as well, and how to maintain the balance between those while having a population that's divided. And the West has also had a difficult role in what to do with Russia, because Russia is sort of not part of the Western-dominated sort of system, but you don't want to keep Russia excluded, but Russia is almost too big to sort of integrate. You can't have Russia as a NATO member or something like that. So that's also been difficult in how to reassure a lot of the allies in the Central and Eastern European areas against who might feel worried about Russia, but without antagonizing Russia. So it's a very difficult sort of balancing act on, mm -hmm. on most parts, if you will. Yeah, so it really is a game, a game of you know, sort of power politics evolving. You need to understand that context, the Cold War, the history, the legacy of Ukraine and its uh, position in there. And yet at the end of the day, it is a crisis in Ukraine at the moment, and, and it stems from, well, more immediately, some four months ago or so, you had uh, the then leader of the Ukraine basically, in effect, reneging on, a, on an agreement he had made with the European Union, whether to pull the country that way, and instead you had Putin presenting an alternative, sort of a Eurasian customs union of sorts, uh, reflecting, again, this push and pull. Uh, but that crisis unfolds, and it leads suddenly a few, fa fast forward a few more months, and now you have an ousted leader of the Ukraine, who apparently is probably in Russia now, a new government that forms very, you know, recent last few weeks, but a crisis in part because now we have Russian military occupying parts and, and what you spoke about Crimea. But back to this notion of Ukraine and, and perhaps, uh, uh, Price, if you can give us a snapshot. I mean, here's a country that itself is complex. It's got a natural divide. Mm -hmm. uh, while we speak of it as the West and East and the Russian Ukraine, there's a little more complexity there. You have other groups, uh, minority groups that have often been moved or brought back. Give us a little context of some of that. Yeah, well, spe even speaking of the Ukraine as a single entity is hard because it's mm -hmm. It always has been that borderland population that you spoke of. Um, in the western Ukraine, you've got the U predominantly Ukrainian-speaking population, which is more pro-European, more pro-Western generally. Um, and there used to be more of that sort of ethnic mix in the east, but of course, under Stalin, they moved a lot of those people, relocated them, and moved ethnic Russians in. So in the sort of central portion of the country, there's now a, an ethnic or a linguistic blend. And, it's not unheard of for people to speak Ukrainian in the home, for example, and Russian out with their friends, or Russian at home and Ukrainian out. It's thought of as fairly normal. We hear that as being a broad divide, but Ukrainians that I know tend to speak of it in terms of, as just what we do. It's not mm -hmm. such a hard and fast thing. The further east you go, the more ethnically Russian it gets, however, mm -hmm. and the more support for, um, and to some degree, nostalgia for the older Soviet period, which we've heard Putin working mm -hmm. on as a theme um, as well as um, some innate sort of dissatisfaction with where the economic development has gone. But then when you get down to the Crimea, that was sort of the land of the Tatars, of course. And, um, and they were moved out, if they I'm were, not mistaken. Yeah, Stalin more or less long, <laughs> moved most of them out. Mm -hmm. And that, while we say it's 60% Russian now, the, term, the number that's thrown around, um, there's still significant ethnic minorities in there that do not support this. So while we'll, we'll see the... Um, sort of de facto, well, the Russian military holds Crimea and that's that, they may be biting off more than they can chew here. Um, as they see, when they go into these places, a lot of economic resistance requires a lot of passive resistance. There could be other armed sort of resistance yeah. as well. So, I mean, clearly what you speak to, we have to understand the issues related to the society, the culture, the inner, you know, workings there, uh, which is a very fluid issue and it changed over time. Uh, I think, again, to put back to where we are, you, you begin with this geopolitical framework. It's a crisis that really is a showdown between some major powers, the West and Russia in particular, played out in Ukraine. You have to delve into the state itself and, and, and its inter internal makings. Uh, and the other challenge I see, and, and obviously we'll continue unraveling in diff different ways, on one end you have a lot of economic uh, interests and issues. I mean, this is a major tr transshipment of, uh, of oil and, and, and you know many pipelines heading through there, making their way west. Uh, the Europeans are concerned about you know how that might impact if there is a, a war or a crisis, uh, the flow of, of that oil and, and, and moreover just who controls it. So on one level it's a political economy question, uh, you know, the interdependence and, and the reliance. And yet the other parts that kind of add to this is these more challenging issues of culture and identity. Uh, and in moments of crisis, these things can flare up. Leaders will use them and spark, uh, you know, you mentioned the nostalgia. And, and yet here's a place that more or less has been able to peacefully exist in this moment of crisis, flaring up tensions, creating divides among people who 
live together. Uh, it, it can be a real tense. And I wonder, maybe just speaking to this question, is it really more the political economy that's defining this, or is it becoming more this issue of culture, people, society? And any mm. thoughts on that? I think it's a blend, actually. I, I, breaking it apart is almost artificial, because I mm. think in most people's minds it is welded one and the same. Part of the reason for the sense of renewed identity in opposition to what Yanukovych was doing was that they hadn't seen the economic development. The pipeline no. goes through, they're not getting any wealthier. In mm. fact, they, their economy is stalled. Um, and on top of that, you've got, of course, a very important uh, Russian base at Sevastopol, mm -hmm. um, which allows for Russian projection in the region, not only transshipping through the Black Sea, but also um, just stationing of significant forces there. And yeah. that provides a split within the Ukrainian society because some of them welcome it, and some of them, to some of them, it's almost an occupation. So there is, before the crisis even erupted, there was popular sentiment further west you went to get rid of the base at Sevastopol. Mm -hmm. But of course this is this Russians only warm water port. They're no, not no. interested in giving that up. And they've got a powerful interest there yeah, obviously and, and so uh, that's a challenge. The other thing that comes to mind now, you know, you, you, you snapshot 10 years ago you had another crisis in Ukraine that led to what was then known as the Orange Revolution, a mm -hmm. desire to obviously move away from the saw, strong authoritarian rule and yet that revolution never quite completed, dashed hopes, you had leaders that came in and suddenly they were out on a continual pattern of corruption and authoritarian rule, uh, and that probably is part of what adds anxiety to the population. They just don't see the results. You mentioned, well, there's a lot of wealth and, and oil and all that, but it's not translated into you know, well-being for the people. Uh, the corruption is another deep issue, and of course Ukraine, like Russia, has many of these so-called oligarchs, and, and I mean, where do they fit into this picture? Are they players, I'm, I'm thinking for, for now we have a lot of them who live in Western Europe and the UK, and there's even been protests in London about you know some of them, uh, and, and what do they speak to? Where do they get their money? Where does this fit into in terms of where they are? Uh, I mean, do they have a, a role in this in any way? Any, any thoughts? It's difficult. I mean, one thing I'd like to just sort of stress more broadly is that one of the mistakes that we often have when we're looking at this sort of from, you know, sort of a Western media prism is that we, or even from a Russian media prism, if you want to watch RT or something, is we tend to simplify this to a sort of East-West confrontation. This is power politics between the West and Russia, and either Russia's, from Russia's case, this is the West manipulating events in Ukraine, so it goes up. From the West perspective, this is Russia strong arming and doing this. So a lot of the core issues that here are Ukrainian, and mm -hmm. they involve Ukrainian politics and economics. And in order to sort of reduce it to sort of just outside powers which are manipulating, I, I think misses a lot of the more deeper issues in the Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of the political and economic problems come from the fact that even though all of this energy and investments and money has gone here, it's mostly gone in the pockets of people in power or these oligarchs mm -hmm. and they haven't, they've avoided making choices to try and develop the country and mm -hmm. sort of make the economy much more dynamic. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the resentment lies. Yeah. And so I think that's sort of the problem we're looking at. It. We're often sort of thinking that the outside forces hold all the cards, but a lot of this original sort of conflict, at least in my mind, comes from Ukrainian issues. It's yeah. between Ukrainians, if you will. And, you know, speaking of Ukraine, I mean, most many cultures, including Ukraine, they've got large diasporas, communities that have left and work in many cases in Western Europe. And to what extent do, do those you know, people having seen, let's say, the West, I'm thinking for, you know, just thinking out loud here, that, you know, people that have seen the European Union, you know, deeper level of development, you know, yearning for some of that. They'd like more democracy, more prosperity, and they go back home and see this, you know, very, you know, old authoritarian model, inefficient, corrupt, and they yearn for change. So there's pressure happening from that. Moreover, we're at a time now where social media just brings these things to the forefront. And, and, and I mean, do you see some of that play out in this crisis as well? The connections of, again, diaspora communities of Ukrainians abroad, or just awareness of changes happening in, in, in the region, particularly to the West? Sure, that's there. I mean, the caution I would have with that is that just because people have means and they travel and they go to the West or wherever, that they're automatically going to sort of come back home with the idea that they want to see sort of political change at home in the same way that they saw in the West. I'm not sure you have a direct causal link there. You can often have people who have means and travel abroad, and they have the means to travel abroad because of the way the system works, and so they're not perhaps interested in rocking the boat in the system. Having said 
said that, yes, the, the link that you have, somebody who goes abroad, uh, you know, and then comes back and then says, we want to have change. But it's not a universal, I think, connection that somebody goes abroad and then comes back and says, well, I want yeah, democracy yeah, just like yeah. they have in the UK or the US or That's something right. like that. It uh, could be that the bread is buttered by the existing <laughs> system as That's it exists right. now. So no, no, well put. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and yet at the same time, I mean, we live in a time where, gosh, even this crisis now, I mean, we're seeing it brought to our headlines. The challenge with all of that, and maybe you can speak to this from uh, past experience in, in Afghanistan and other areas where we see these, you know, snapshots of a crisis here, and yet you have to step back and, you know, understand, well, is this just a small thing? Is it a big thing? Uh, you know, how does media impact our, our ability to understand what's going on? Well, in a real sense, um, military theorists have argued that this has really changed the tempo, at least, of the way these conflicts happen, because um, now a very small demonstration can light a fire mm -hmm. in the surrounding areas. We saw this during the Arab Spring. We've seen it in Afghan areas as well. Um, here, the contacts that I had were tweeting and posting on Facebook and YouTube, et cetera, within hours of demonstrations going on. That lit fires in other areas. Yeah. So the dissatisfaction, the core that was there was clearly there already. But they can become a white, become, you know, move much faster now, given the, um, the techno technological base. One thing a lot of people were telling me as this thing was firing up was, because I was asking them, where was the, okay, I understand how it's moved rapidly, but what's the core? What are you really upset about? And it's like, well, every, what I was told in a lot of cases by Western Ukrainians was, well, everything the Russians touched, we have problems with those people from that era who did things in the old Soviet way. Mm. We want to go, and this is mostly the younger crowd, we want to go the, the Western mm. way, the new way. Um, but we have all these people, much like West Germany experienced with East Germany, who were brought up in a different system, that same group that you were alluding mentality. to before. Yeah. And many of them have benefited by that mentality. So yeah. they expect to be taken care of and such. And so you have a fundamental conflict of identity over what direction. Yeah. Um, it's too simple struggle. to say what direction Ukrainians want to go. There, there's a divided. Yeah. Putin's comment about the worst thing to ever happen to the world was the fall of the Soviet Union, for example. There are Rush, ethnic Russians who, who look back with nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is fascinating. Of course, we're going to continue this conversation, but in just a moment, we're going to take a short break right now and be back with more on the story. So please stay tuned and join us. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people <laughs> and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Come okay, join it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. See you. Aloha, we're back and we're live and we're Think Tech. This is Global Connections and I'm joined today by two eminent scholars who have a good background to help us make sense of this crisis in Ukraine, an unraveling story that we're going to see full unfold. And clearly, as we've just heard, Patrick Braddon, Brian Price, um, on one hand, it is a geopolitical context, what's happening. On another level, it is really, we have to look within what's Ukraine and its story and its people and, and some of the challenging and issues there. And at another level, it's also a crisis that involves particular individuals. We have a president in Russia, Vladimir Putin, just came off of a rather, we could say, successful uh, Winter Olympics, everything went reasonably well there, but now, within hours and days, suddenly he's now at the center of a major confrontation with largely the West, European uh, and, and the U.S., uh, and yet you also have Barack Obama, a presidency that's been challenged, and now he's facing a major foreign policy crisis, what to do. And I wonder, you know, given where we stand now, and again, it's an unraveling thing, it could go different ways. We heard that even today, the President, actually Obama, had a long conversation with Putin. Uh, but what now? What are some of the potential scenarios or options? And again, you have many players. On one hand, the U.S., you also have the European Union, which is stepping forward to provide and offer, you know, some sort of aid package. Uh, obviously, the new uh, government there trying to look more towards that. Can you give us a sense, of either of you, what are some of the, you know, different scenarios or options or even for that matter in the military we you know maybe an update as, as, as what we know right now what are the issues there we understand the Russians have you know are, are you know are they occupying everything parts of it they've come in without insignias but we know they're Russians what, what, help us unravel a little bit of the uh, confusion 
I hear you yeah, want to speak to the military yeah. issue. Yeah. I mean, obviously, as you said, I mean, we've got uh, first starting with uh, a lot of the fleet personnel that are the Russian fleet mm -hmm. personnel that are stationed there, and then been sub, yeah, Spetsnaz and paratroopers and Marine infantry and so on. You know, sort of the better quality sort of Russian troops, if you will, not sort of motor rifle sort yeah. of people, um, have gone in and occupied a lot of the areas, and you see a lot of these kind of standoffs with Ukrainian soldiers, or sailors on ships. You see soldiers and airmen in bases, mm -hmm. and the Russians won't let them go out. And you have these vague, not vague. Various reports, I should say, of different ultimatums, you know, mm -hmm. throw down your weapons, get out of the base. And there have been some efforts by the Ukrainians, some quite brazen ones, to sort of challenge those regime, mm -hmm. uh, those sort of uh, blockades, if you will. Obviously, I mean, as we talked about earlier, I mean, the Crimea is such an important area for Russia. For Russia yeah. uh, so, I mean, obviously, the Russians are going to want to make sure that their base and then whatever else happens to their Crimea. I mean, I think the, the, the tricky thing, though, is, I mean, if you look at it from the Ukrainian perspective, I mean, the Ukrainians, while they did inherit a large sort of Soviet sort of military, if you will, at independence, I mean, that hasn't really been their spending priority, if you will. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, the Ukrainian military is sort of a shell of what it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, although Putin has invested a lot uh, the past couple of years in the Russian military, I mean, it's not exactly the, you know, the Cold War height of, you know, Soviet capabilities in the 1970s. No, no. And we saw that in the Georgian War. We've seen that mm -hmm. in the long Chechen campaign. A lot of shortcomings to Russian military uh, capabilities at that. Um, Beyond that, uh, Brian, would you? Yeah. yeah. On the Ukrainian side, they they do have a self-defense force. It is fairly numerous. However, it's mostly regionalized for cost reasons. Mm -hmm. So troops, you know, brought in from eastern Ukraine largely serve in the eastern Ukraine, western Ukraine, the same, and importantly, in the Crimea as well. So the Ukraine's native forces there will be a blend, many of whom, though, will not be interested in taking up arms against fellow Ukrainians. Yeah. So it was a fairly easy thing, I think, for the Russians to move in. Um, the United States, of course, has said we're going to move six F-15s, I believe it is, to Poland, along with some KC-135 tankers, um, ostensibly to protect Poland. Now, we don't, as far as I know, we don't have any reports of troops, credible reports of troops, in the Ukraine apart from the Crimea. Mm -hmm. been, there were some reports in various potential Spetsnaz incursions, but we don't know if those are true mm -hmm. in the east. Um, and the Ukrainians have activated um, and had very successful recruiting in the self-defense force over the last mm -hmm. two weeks or so. Um, under the new government, um, but they're scrambling. And so nobody really wants to see this go to a military conflict because everyone would lose. Um, that being said, um, the CIA predicted that Putin would go in, DOD predicted that he would not go in. We're seeing this play out in the intelligence sort of mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's an open question as to maybe, does he intend to stop at the Crimea or what is the plan? And one interesting point that mm -hmm. came out in the last few days, I mean, uh, Putin was announcing this was as a humanitarian right. gesture. He was there to protect the interests of, you, <laughs> of the Russians there, and no intention of taking over, occupying, uh, or, or you know, invading Ukraine. And, and just an interesting spin. And yet, here's another angle in that you know, from the West and certainly the United States in particular, we've been very critical, violating the sovereignty of a country, international law, etc. And you know, whatever one makes of it from the U.S. perspective, certainly many foreigners uh, and including many Europeans, will often look at that as ringing a little hollow. The U.S. can pick and choose when it wants to intervene. Why should we be able to hold uh, Russia to the standard? You know, some would say, well, we're, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, we're, we're upholding, you know, democratic uh, interests and values. How much do you see that playing out in terms of whether the U.S. and particularly the U.S., you know, are we, can we be seen as hypocritical or holding a double standard for Russia's interests, which is right there after all, and for us it meant, you know, sure. pretty far? I mean, you got Obviously, I mean, the U.S. and the West has to, again, have this kind of balance act where they, they can't let the action go without some sort of sanction. So whether it's economic, diplomatic, some sort of thing, slap on the wrist or whatever you like to call it, provided Putin doesn't go too far. Because they have to sort of maintain that standard. On the other hand, this is Russia's sphere of influence. Uh, there's not really like the United States or the European Union would like to fight Russia militarily with Ukraine. Nobody yeah, wants that. Yeah. So there's a kind of realization. I mean, the analogy some people have made, you know, sort of in a lot of news reports lately, this is sort of no different than what the U.S. did in Grenada, what the U.S. has done in Panama. This is That was sort of U.S. Monroe doctrine area. This is the Monroe-ski doctrine, yeah. as it's sometimes mm -hmm. called for the Russians. This but ours has ended. Influence. We heard Kerry announce a few weeks, uh, a couple of months ago, the Monroe Doctrine has ended for us. Oh, uh, and yet again, for, perhaps the Cold War is re more recent, so it hasn't quite ended for them. Um, you know, we mentioned the case of Georgia, and this is not the state of Georgia in the south of the peaches, but of course the independent state of Georgia in the southern, you know, part of, of, of 
of the former Soviet Union, now one of the independent states. And in 2008, you had a situation there. I mean, can any of you give us a quick snapshot here? The Russians essentially did intervene militarily, uh, taking on a, essentially a form of an insurgency, a separatist movement. Uh, what, what was the situation there, very briefly? And how, how has it been used to compare to the current? Well, those nationalist sentiments exist throughout, not only the East, but they were in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. etc. Um, something that the Soviets struggled with, mm -hmm. um, largely behind the curtain, because we didn't, I think, understand in that era how mm -hmm. important this was within the, the political dynamics of the region. Um, certainly when the Georgians expressed an interest in coming over towards closer to the West, Russia saw that as a crucial mm -hmm. um, influence of the West in their sphere of influence. Yeah. One thing you hear a lot now is that Russians tend to, they've always had kind of an autocratic view of the world, so it's in some ways difficult in the political consciousness to understand something like the Ukraine where it isn't orchestrated from the top. Mm -hmm. So they tend to see it as, well, this must be driven from someone else, therefore it must be yeah. in the U.S. or the State Department influence. or somebody else. Yeah. It can't possibly be a ground, because that's not the way politics work. Mm -hmm. So it provides a, this, I think they have the same misunderstanding in Georgia. Mm -hmm. This must be a CIA or State Department-led coup, and therefore we're going to go in and we're going to um, snap this yeah. down. The fact that they were able to do it initially and go in and invade was one thing, but as they found out in Afghanistan initially and then subsequently Chechnya and Georgia, these things can get to be very, very expensive. And yeah. I think that's one of Putin's concerns about if you were to go anywhere else that maybe uh, Chet Crimea maybe, but Beyond that, it'll be harder, it's right? probably difficult. Yeah. And, and of course, maybe speaking of some of the limitations, uh, the tools that are available for the outside world, the U particularly the West, uh, European Union and the U.S., I mean, uh, an invasion or an intervention from us is not going to happen. Uh, at this point, it's going to be putting the squeeze through sanctions of various kinds. There's also just a flurry of shuttle diplomacy. Uh, I wonder, you know, what does this tell us about either the changing dynamics of NATO, the European Union, which itself, I mean, there, there's overlap, but they're also increasingly defining their roles. Uh, what does this say about the changing dynamics of, again, maybe diplomacy and, and security cooperation mm. in, in this region? It's difficult. I mean, one thing I'd like to pick up on, on the I mean, you mentioned the Georgian War, um, that I think is in the forefront, or at least the back of Putin's mind, is there was a tremendous amount of economic backlash to Russia from the Georgia War in 08. From, from the West and from other players? From so. the West and other players, yeah. but the difficulty is that's also linked to the other financial economic things that happened in 2008 as yeah, well. Yeah, so yeah. it's difficult to sort of isolate, you know, how much of that was the global financial crisis, yeah. how much of that was reaction to Georgia. But, but it was that, a painful response painful of sorts, Russia. yeah. And so, again, that's something that's in his mind, and Ukraine is probably going to have a larger response than Georgia had, yeah, right? because yeah, yeah. Ukraine, as far as the U.S., is a larger, much more important country. So, I mean, that's something that's in yeah, LA, yeah. if you will. Beyond that, I mean, we see a lot of the same sort of issues that we've seen before. I mean, it's difficult for the European Union to act with a single voice because the different member states have different interests. Mm -hmm. So particularly, you're probably not going to see a very strong sort of response from Germany because Germany has a much tighter economic relationship with Russia and Angela Merkel's been not very, um, how should we say, enthusiastic yeah. about taking a tough stance against yeah. Russia. Um, obviously, she's not going to have this sort of um, very welcoming stance that her uh, predecessor had uh, toward Putin, uh, Gerhard Schroeder. But you're going to see splits in the EU, and of course the United States is occupied in other areas as well. I mean, it's uh, trying to get out of Afghanistan yeah. and yeah. all these other issues. So it's going to be a difficult to have sort of a coordinated, yeah. unified response oh, said, to, yeah. to, to, to Russia's actions, which is you know what we've seen before with mm -hmm. this. And it's, again, it's just amplified because Ukraine is so much much larger, much more important than, yeah. say, Georgia or these other countries. Are and of course, the other element is NATO, where we actually do have a seat at the table, the Europeans and the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and NATO is a military alliance. Its focus is security. And while the first 40, 50 years, it didn't have much going on other than you know a, a pressure for the Soviet Union, uh, the last 20 years, it's been figuring out, redefining its role. This is a security crisis. They do have a regularized process of meetings and coordination, and yet, much like you described in the EU, probably hard to have a single cohesive voice. Uh, we've heard some statements coming out of the NATO uh, head. To head. Uh, um, I'm wondering, you know, I think what I saw at the outset too, before it flared up, you had a series of, I guess there were efforts from, uh, I was intrigued to see, to see the role of the Polish uh, foreign minister, mm -hmm. very interesting, because Poland, you know, hasn't really been a major player in world affairs, but this is a critical issue for them. I mean, they have a close link, historical ties, even parts of Poland and Ukraine have sort of shifted the, the boundaries. This is their immediate 
you know, border and neighbor, and Poland is a major player now, part of NATO, part of the EU, and so interesting to see, if anything, its role is kind of shaping, you know, hey, we've got, a, we've got something to say and an ability to negotiate. Uh, very interesting. Well, um, I think, as we've seen already, I mean, this is a challenging and complex issue. Many players, many pieces, many layers going on, these various levels. I mean, the, the you know, want to turn as we come back for, from another short break to really look at some of the individual players. I mean, for Vladimir Putin, this is a real moment of mm -hmm. sort of brinksmanship and test. Uh, you know, he came out of, I said earlier, he came out of the Winter Olympics, worked out okay. Somehow, uh, he, despite the yellow water, he managed to uh, keep things uh, in, in good standing, and yet now he's really put onto the, you know, onto the front, and, and if you look at the news coverage, certainly in the U.S. and the West, you know, he's painted as the, you know, the, uh, well, uh, the bad guy here. But uh, what's, in, what's at stake for him? What is his role? And maybe on the other side, in other individuals. United States President Barack Obama, what is this going to mean for him? Uh, but let me suggest we'll have a short break right here to continue. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll be back with more on the story. Castle and Cook, Hawaii. Investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Collateral Analytics. Empowering the real estate industry to make better informed property investment decisions. The Foreign Trade Zone. Bringing the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone programs to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. Galen Ho. A senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, incorporating diverse perspectives to design a flexible and forward-looking energy strategy. Hawaii Energy, the state's energy and efficiency program created to help Hawaii's residents and businesses adopt a clean energy lifestyle. Hawaii Gas, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Hawaii Pacific Health, bringing technology and teamwork together to transform healthcare in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, attached to DBED, is the state's leading technology agency. The Scheidler Family Foundation, supporting educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tank. Aloha, we're back and we're live and we're Think Tech. And this is the show Global Connections, where we both bring the world to you and we help make sense of that world too. Uh, we're talking today about a very important issue at the headlines right now, and it is the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, it's unfolded here in the last few weeks and it will surely be with us for some time. And while we've got a military aspect of it, of course, uh, really what, what probably is uh, equally worrisome is the potential it could have for economic crisis. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but as I was unraveling before the break, uh, you know, we've talked about the geopolitical, we've talked a little bit about the internal dynamics of the state and the country and the people of Ukraine, but ultimately this is a crisis that has individual leaders, decision makers, who are both making choices, as we saw in the case of Russia's Vladimir Putin. Uh, what does this tell us about him? And of course, we've got, off, um, you know, many of our analysts are trying to make sense of his, you know, worldview, his way of thinking, how can we shape his behavior, what can we do. Uh, we had a, a reports now that President Barack Obama had a long conversation with him today. I'm curious what that might have been. Uh, and so perhaps, uh, uh, Professor Bratton, if you can give us a snapshot of, you know, the role of individuals. We often do know in history they matter. And, and here's a leader who's been in power, I think, about 14 years, kind of took a break and switched <laughs> kind of. sides with his with his prime minister, but he's back now. Uh, how much is this really his own sort of, you know, I don't know, his own baby, you know, to give himself a, a, either a boosting in the ratings or to give him a place in history, or is this the kind of thing that could potentially backfire for him? I mean, what are your thoughts? All of the above. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's an interesting character. I mean, I, I, oftentimes we sort of reduce Putin to former KGB FSB, and he likes to have lots of photos with him doing manly things wrestling bears and breaking boards and I know yeah, chopping down trees back. with his bare yeah. hands and other things like sort of Chuck Norris sort of <laughs> that figure. Um, but there's a little something more complicated with this and it also sort of reflects a, a sort of trend within within Russia. And so sort of going back to what I said earlier, you know, the sort of dissatisfaction in the 1990s to sort of Yeltsin sort of, you know, push toward the West, a sort of more sort of pro-Western sort of foreign policy, a lot of his advisors, Gadar and all of these other people. And so what you see 
is the sort of dissatisfaction with sort of Russia groveling at mm -hmm. the feet of the West, and then also dissatisfaction with the sort of disorganized sort of drunkenness of sort of Yeltsin, and then Yeltsin's greater family, particularly his daughter and other people who used to run things in the Kremlin in the late 1990s. So what you see with Putin is a rise of this group that often people call the Siloviki, which means tough guys in Russian, which is a sort of people with security sector backgrounds, FSB, MVD, interior ministry, all this kind of things, that are seen by the Russians to better represent sort of what sort of, if you will, simplified version of sort of Russian national interests abroad, that these guys are capable, uh, they don't, they're not as drunk, um, and they're not as corrupt, say, perhaps, as Yeltsin's, and they're going to make sure that Russia has sort of a stronger sort of role regionally and internationally. And that's really one of sort of Putin's goals, is to make sure that Russia is a global player, particularly within a Russian conception of a multipolar world. It rejects the sort of idea that we're still in a unipolar world sort of run by the United States. And so he has this sort of pragmatic yet sort of nationalist foreign policy of rising up Russia's strengths and making sure that Russia's a player and Russia has a seat at the table. And this idea that Russia's sort of going to grovel at the feet of the EU or the US for economic handouts and these sorts of things, that's going to be sort of de-emphasized. This is a Russia that still matters the same way that Russia mattered in the Cold War or at the height of Tsar's power in the 19th century. And so that's very sort of integral to sort of Putin's worldview and the worldview of a lot of people around him. Yeah. And that has resonance, particularly within Russian elites and then not Russian masses. But I mean, there's differences there, and there's been a lot of polling data between elites and masses and who supports Putin. So it's not uniform sort of support for Putin as we've seen with some of the protests the past two years against uh, Putin's rule and things. Uh, but having a foreign policy success would, of course, help him yeah. as well. But I wouldn't reduce it down just to sort of domestic politics. This also is something that's key to sort of his concept of Russia and what Russia should be doing. Yeah, that Russia yeah. should have a say in what goes on. And, of course, and, and in the changing, you know, the rise of China, the European Union, and it's, you know, well, now consolidated 28 members. What, where does Russia fit into that? And, and uh, one of the things, of course, of course, and even again for someone like Putin, I mean, his survival depends not just on maybe how he defines it and, and, and the risk involved in this, but ultimately his ability to keep you know, basically things flowing, keep his economy alive and well, and, and there's a deep interdependence between Russia and this region of Ukraine, industrial and, and, and agricultural and all types. But this crisis, uh, aside from the military and security aspects we've talked about, fundamentally it has a real risk of economic crisis, economic, uh, you know, this, you know, allocation and things. Uh, and, you know, someone like Putin, he needs, you know, obviously to keep things going well if it gets worse that he suffers. But as well, you could imagine a lot of the Europeans are nervous about this, what this might do if it affects, you know, uh, particularly, uh, you know, energy uh, you know, resources and the like, or if it affects markets for them. Uh, the EU has announced uh, plans to, you know, make available some, you know, quick cash because we know the Ukrainian economy is in deep crisis. And if it doesn't get some infusion, uh, it will implode. Uh, but whatever the Europeans can come up with, 15 billion, whatever number it is, it's not likely to be enough. It's not going to turn things around immediately. Moreover, the Ukraine, while it may move towards the West, it's not going to join the EU anytime too soon. Uh, and that's going to leave many disenchanted. Maybe try to unravel, and if you want to add anything to this about the economic dimensions, the economic crisis, what are you know who are the potential losers, or, or you know what 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 are some scenarios there? Sure. Well, very frequently in speaking with the Ukrainians, they would talk about the the economic crisis as being the spark that set this thing off, and that's because the economy has not succeeded in developing in, in a robust sense. There's some talk of the the kleptocracy kind of approach where people have, as you mentioned earlier, have taken money out of the country. So the wonder is, okay, well, even if the U.S. gives a billion and the EU gives 15 billion, it's a lot of that 15 billion is going to go right back to Russia for <laughs> energy anyway, and what doesn't may just go into the same pockets of the same individuals. So there's a, a tension based around the economics. And um, that cultural divide I mentioned earlier within the Ukraine, but broader than that, the Ukraine is obviously a crucially important transit zone, for not mm -hmm. only for the natural gas for all of and uh, oil for Western Europe, but also trade goods going back and forth. Um, almost all of that goes through the Ukraine, and yet they don't gain much benefit from it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, if the Ukraine does not become a part of NATO or the EU, and yet it's not really part of Russia, where does that leave it in an economic sense? No. I mean, can anything really happen there? Um, perhaps there can be some regional agreements with Poland and, and Belarus, etc., maybe, but that's uncertain. Uh, another aspect of this, remember, is that the U.S. forces trying to get out of Afghanistan are using that road through Russia and into this zone, into this very zone, mm -hmm. to 
transship our goods out of there. We can't go through Pakistan now because they've closed that border. Mm -hmm. um, Pakistan has no port, or Afghanistan has no port rather, so um, we need this route through. So while there's a lot of saber rattling going on about broad sanctions, I don't really see much of that happening because every, all parties are interdependent in this case. Um, now what you have seen discussed are targeted um, sanctions against individuals. Yeah. Um, that, much like any other form of es trade escalation though, has the, pretend, the possibility of spinning out of control mm -hmm. and having collateral, massive collateral damage. Mm -hmm. um, so it could spin into uh, lack of transit rights, shutting on and off of the gas, et cetera, which mm -hmm. of course uh, would be catastrophic for the region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, these are tough dilemmas. And so as we finish, we'll come back in another few minutes for, from a short break. And, and one of the challenges, I guess, is what do we make of this? Where do we go from here? And particularly, what do we take away? Are there any lessons learned or any things that this crisis kind of shows us both maybe the power of history, the, uh, the you know, the importance on uh, some level of geopolitics is alive and well. I mean, it is not something of the past, I mean, whether it's the Cold War, not quite, but some version of great power politics is at play. Uh, or really, at the end of the day, that we live in a world of global interdependence that whatever happens in some place is going to affect everyone else and that changes the equation. So we'll come back after one last break and, and please join us for the final part of our show. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Hi. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. And we're back and we're live, and this is Global Connections, part of the Think Tech series, and I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, joined today by two guests that are giving us a good perspective on this crisis in Ukraine. Patrick Bratton, a political scientist, lots of expertise on national security and understanding some of the geopolitical challenges, and Brian Price, a historian who gives us a good understanding from his own experience. Uh, uh, you had mentioned at the outset, I guess I want to uh, maybe revisit that, that you had an opportunity some years ago, you were basically deployed in Afghanistan where you had an opportunity to be part of the Army's Human Terrain System program, and I think what that speaks to, of course, is in these conflicts of today, these are not just military Military sort of issues. I mean, they're very complex identity, culture, and understanding the social political context for our military as well is vital. And and I wonder as we you know conclude our, our show today. I mean, what are some of the takeaways? Uh, what type of lessons do we draw from this? What does it tell us about enduring patterns of you know whatever either repeating itself or maybe are there new new issues that are there. So let me ask each of you, perhaps starting with you, Bratton, what, what do you take away from this uh, <laughs> crisis? It's a difficult one. <laughs> it's difficult. Well, I think the big caution, again, this has underlined uh, some things that have come up before, but there were some moments, you know, sort of in the 1990s, but particularly in the aughts, I guess that's what we call them, right? They really, the first decade of the, of, 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 to the 2000s, is that there was a, a sort of um, almost a, a, a cavalierness and sort of expanding sort of promises to a lot of the Eastern European countries mm -hmm. and the Caucasus and so on to be part of the West but not really going as far as to fully integrate them into NATO and the EU and without perhaps always sort of gauging how the Russian perspective of that and how that perspective was actually in the country themselves particularly divided countries complicated countries like the Ukraine and I you know I always struck um, I my mentor was sort of a guy who worked a lot on NATO and right before the 2002 Big Bang expansion of both NATO and EU, you know, he said, oh, well, you know, doing a Big Bang expansion would be really foolhardy and in tech <laughs> And then, you know, about two weeks later, boom, they, boom yeah, you know, they did it. three times what he was predicting yeah, uh, they yeah. would do. So and in other words, don't predict, just, don't, you know, step well, back. Well, not just don't predict, but um, I think <laughs> there, there's been risks that yeah. people in the EU, NATO, and the West have done when dealing with sort of what Russia considers to be its backyard and perhaps over-promising yeah. some of these regimes, both security protection, economic integration, Integration that's just quite not there, and mm. Russia, sort of as we've seen with this one, is it's 
unwilling to accept that. And yeah. I think that puts these countries in a difficult situation. I think the other lesson will be is whether or not if Putin can manage this and get away with it, you know, in a sense of what he would like to do, or will this come back, will this blow up on him? I mean, have they yeah. bitten off, as, as you were alluding to, have they bit off more than they can chew, particularly if they look at the eastern Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, and will the economic uh, situation uh, and difficulties uh, be too much for them? Because, again, it, it's cavalier to say we're going to annex, you, you know, Crimea or something like that. But actually to try and integrate that into a larger Russian Federation that has its own problems and separatist yeah. Yeah. movements and other things like that. I mean, could be quite, could be quite explosive. In That's right. No. And uh, what do you take away from some you know, of this? we see in a lot of ways, um, I think the extreme um, complication of local affairs and how they have a, a cascading sort of effect of these second and third order effects, not only in like the unpredictable responses in terms of bringing geopolitics and bringing countries into NATO, but um, small local changes that can mm -hmm. suddenly blow up. Um, David Galula defines a revolution as a resistance like this that's unpredicted, it's not directed. And I think Ukraine's a good example of that, where it just sort of popped up and then everyone's left with kind of a sense of, well, what do we do with this now? Mm -hmm. um, it also shows that um, there have been people discussing sort of post-force international arrangements, and while we would all like that, um, Russia's clear move into the Crimea, albeit cloaked, but still there, means that we're not past that era as much as we would like it to be so. Um, and so we see on one hand this sort of, as it's sometimes called the fourth generation, networked groups together having a, a groundswell effect, but sometimes reactionary regimes are going to move against that, and I don't want to entirely classify Russia as reactionary, but clearly Russia made a, a move directed from the top at the Crimea, mm -hmm. probably in large part because of the base of Sevastopol and Warmwater Port, but yeah. those kind of concerns are going to exist elsewhere in the world, and it underlines difficulties we've had in making decisions about places like Syria and, mm -hmm. and Libya. Um, these are very complicated local mm -hmm. environments that um, policymakers in the Syrian case probably rightly stood back and said, how do we do this yeah. without encouraging the wrong people? Yeah. And while it, there's a weakness expressed there, perhaps, that mm -hmm. may encourage things like this, on the other hand, in places even Afghanistan is much more complex than Iraq, for example, but um, in terms of the socio-cultural layout. But even in terms of Iraq, we didn't understand anything about the, the divides, and certain analysts did, mm -hmm. but the, the mm -hmm. policymakers didn't. And Afghanistan's three times as complex. Mm -hmm. Syria complex again, Libya's got its own dynamics, Egypt its own, every region like this where there's a temptation to sort of do policing actions or mm -hmm. extend influence carries with it these uncertain and largely unpredictable effects. Yeah, and often one, again, the unpredictable is because it takes on a life of its own and things that you just cannot foresee. Uh, I mentioned earlier how when you have these moments of crisis, you would tend to find nationalist leaders will take advantage and push these sure. buttons. And, mm -hmm. and here's a place that, again, coexisted for many years with Russians and Ukrainians and even the ethnic minorities. While they had a harsh history of being moved, you know, they were in some cases coming there. back mm -hmm. and then they are a minority. But uh, one of the things that we've seen again and again, and I guess it, it even speaks to, I think, the challenge of, of, of a Ukraine uh, connecting to the European Union, the whole European Union experiment has come under tremendous pressure and challenge and, and disenchantment. Uh, we saw a tremendous expansion in 10 years ago now in 04 followed in 07 by two more, Romania and Bulgaria. Those were latecomers because they weren't quite ready, and in many ways they were easily just brought in, uh, quite not quite ready for prime time. Uh, we want to not forget Croatia joined this past July to become the 28th member, but the main point is that today the European Union, after crisis in the last few years, it, it has left a lot of people disenchanted with it. It hasn't brought everybody that prosperity. You've also seen in the midst of crisis the rise of a lot of right-wing nationalist groups mm -hmm. pushing that. And so, you know, Ukraine has to be careful in looking at, you know, that future is one that's not going to promise them, you know, great prosperity easily. And yet, of course, on another level, it does integrate them into the markets and it does offer some possibilities of change there. But how do you temper that? It, you know, over-promising, uh, disenchantment, uh, disillusion, uh, and uh, that's going to be tough. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, I think what, what it underscores, and we've heard very well from you, is this need to understand a, a complex crisis like this. You've got to look at so many different components, so many levels. Uh, it is a system, you know, it's a product of the end of the Cold War and, and sort of some aspects of it that, that speak to that. It is a showdown between the major Russia and, and its, you know, leader uh, with the West and European Union and, and the U.S. as well, but it's also ultimately a crisis of the Ukraine and the people and the challenges and the choices that they have to make, the leadership, the corruption, those changing dynamics. Uh, we have, of course, then, you know, 
uh, a world in which now new media, new issues, new technologies, you described even uh, maybe tech, uh, military technologies. I mean, the, the wars that we're going to continue fighting are not the wars of 50, 100 years ago, but instead more you know, a form of a, you know, well, uh, different kind of Cold War, I suppose. Uh, I think it's been valuable to just get this insight from you and, and helping inform our listeners uh, this is a crisis that will still be with us unfolding. Uh, as analysts, we have to be careful what to predict in the future. We've not gotten it very well. I, I, I can remember myself as a graduate student in the mid to late 80s, uh, even the best Sovietologists no. you know, would not come out and say, oh, yeah, it'll just, you know, a couple of years from now, no, it'll all fall that. apart. No. You would be ridiculed. And 89, 90 comes, and it all falls apart. And, and our best... No. Uh, folks didn't quite predict that. Uh, so we're not here to predict what's going to happen in Ukraine, but we're trying to make some sense of it, try to give some perspective. And again, this information uh, valuable for us to just be informed about it and understand that the world we're in is interconnected, interdependent, the choices, the issues, and even our leaders now. I mean, they're held accountable for their actions, and we have to be mindful, vigilant, and uh, but more than anything, not have simplistic views. These are complex issues. They require us to think deeply and analytically, and uh, I want to thank both of you for this uh, valuable opportunity to kind of try to unravel some of it. Uh, we'll see it unfold. We may have to come back and make more sense out of the next stages, but uh, for now, really grateful to give us this broader perspective on the crisis in Ukraine, a complex issue, but this is the world we're in and it's part of our global connection. So thank you both, uh, Patrick Bratton, and Brian Price for joining me today and giving us insights and our listeners, thank you for joining us. I want to just remind everybody that obviously we broadcast live here every day. We've got shows from the Think Tech series that go from about one to five daily. If you want to join us here in our downtown studio, you can welcome to join us as a, as a listener. Uh, we've got many people to thank. I'll just mention briefly our production manager, Ian Davidson. We've got communication director, Chrissy Goffett again. We've got Jay Fidel who helps us bring it all together. And of course, thank you, our listeners, for listening. Uh, these are shows that are always kept. Uh, you see them live, but if you miss it, you can catch them on the Think Tech Hawaii uh, website and find a YouTube video of this, share it with friends, uh, and, and basically thank you for staying informed on this. Uh, look forward to our next show, Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. Thank you. <laughs>